Since the Russian invasion of Ukraine on February 24th, we talked a lot about anti-tank guided missiles, the javelins and the end laws, the weapons that were so important in helping to halt the Russian armoured thrusts in the early stages of the war. We talked about drones, including the famous TB2 Bayraktars, that had tremendous success in the early stages of the war, but do now find themselves a little more challenged by the cohesive Russian air defence. But above all, there is one combat arm that has dominated the later stages of the Ukrainian war, and that's the one that we're going to be talking about today. The artillery, the centrepiece of Russian military doctrine, and one of the most decisive weapons of the war to date in eastern Ukraine. Because sometimes new problems require old solutions, and where airborne assaults and rapid armour advances have failed, well, there's not exactly much left in the Russian playbook other than the steady application of 60,000 rounds a day until the enemy ceases to exist. Now, before we jump into all of that, with that said, a word from our sponsor for today's video. Today's sponsor is Private Internet Access. No product's going to make you invulnerable on the internet, but using a VPN to change your IP address, reroute and hide your traffic is a good step towards safety and privacy online. Private Internet Access is an established open source VPN provider with over 30 million downloads and a proven record of not logging user activity. Now the service is multi-platform. I run it on Windows and Android, but Mac, Linux, iOS and others are all available as well. And it's a super simple to customize tool so you can make sure it meets your personal needs. And yes, that is my phone. And yes, I do tend to connect as a New Zealander who doesn't like Kiwis. If you've listened to the channel for a while, you'll know I have a preference for things that I can read into or verify. Private Internet Access makes their entire code base public. So if you are code minded, you can crack it open, get beneath the hood and make sure that it's doing exactly what it says it's doing. And that no logs policy that I mentioned at the start, I was able to find reporting that showed that's been tested in court a couple of times and held up just fine. So if you are interested, the Private Internet Access team have set up a promotional offer for those of you watching today. If you click through the link below, you can sign up and get a pretty impressive 82% discount on subscription. It's about $2.11 a month, plus you get three extra months entirely free. There's a free trial available and a 30-day refund period, so if you are interested, click below and give it a shot. So what am I going to be covering? First, I'm going to look at the opposing arms as they were before the outbreak of the Russian-Ukrainian war. I'm going to look at the Russian artillery arm, the Ukrainian artillery arm, and put them side to side in terms of the equipment they had available to them. Then I'm going to give a little bit of a summary of how the artillery war to date has evolved, how artillery was useful during the opening stages, during the Russian assault on Kyiv, and how it's evolved as the fight has shifted towards a more static fight in the Donbass and the eastern parts of Ukraine. Then I'm going to look at ammunition and sustainment issues. It's, it's me. It wouldn't be one of my videos if we didn't look at economics, procurement or sustainment in some way. So we're going to discuss ammunition supply, barrel life and items like that. Then we're going to take this all together and we're going to look for potential early lessons that we can take away. Just as with our drones video, just as with our discussion of the future of the tank, we're going to see if using the information we have available, there might be any early lessons here for NATO countries or indeed for countries around the world. Before I jump in, there is a reminder as always that I'm coming at this from a very specific perspective. I'm coming at this issue from a strategic, from a procurement, and from a logistics lens. There are plenty of combat veterans out there on YouTube and other sources that are happy to talk about the specific tactics that are being employed. Instead, I'm going to be focusing on the overview, coupled with the lessons we can take in terms of the big picture. Long before the February invasion of Ukraine, the Russian army was known as an artillery-heavy and centric force. Historically, the Soviet Union placed an immense emphasis in its doctrine and its tactics on the mass deployment of both gun and rocket-based artillery systems. This sort of doctrinal inheritance has passed into the hands of the Russian army. And while the vast numbers of weapons that defined the Soviet Union are no longer present, the Russian army is still one of the most heavily armed forces in the world when it comes to gun and rocket artillery. They've employed it to great effect in all of their post-1991 conflicts falling back on it whenever other more complicated tactics have failed. They fell back on it in Grozny, they fell back on it in Syria, and now, after the initial attempts at a manoeuvre war in Ukraine, they've fallen back on it there too. And if you have any doubt as to how important the Russians consider artillery, you just have to look at the military balance 2021 figures that I've used here. The Russian ground forces had more than 4,500 artillery systems in service in 2021. That includes 1,900 self-propelled guns, which is where the artillery system is mounted in its own mobile mount, like the Muster S guns that you see there. Only 150 old-style towed guns. They had more than 870 MLRS, which means multiple launch rocket systems, which is where you take a big pot of rockets, stick it on a motorized platform, and go fire them all off at someone. This started for the Russians with the Katyusha of World War II and has evolved into much more modern forms. 
And then finally, there's the mortars, the lighter, shorter ranged indirect fire weapon that lob a shell in a high trajectory so it can come plunging down on the target. But in addition to that 4,500 pieces of active kit, which is actually less than what the United States was able to field in the same year, the Russians have this titanic reserve of old Cold War and even some World War II era kit in reserve. Another 4,200 self-propelled guns, 12,000 old towed guns, 3,220 old MLRS systems, and an additional 2,590 mortars. That is a lot of boom when you consider, when we talked about Germany the other day, that the Bundeswehr was considered dangerously undergunned if it handed off more than seven of its self-propelled guns at any given time. The old joke goes that the Russians and the Soviets never really throw anything away in a military sense, and certainly when you look at their artillery park, that seems to be the case. It is in fact such a ludicrously large number of things that go boom, that if you stripped everyone, and I mean basically everyone, the administrators, the cooks, the truck drivers, everyone that you could find in Russia's pre-war ground forces, you might, might be able to man all of these systems but then you'd be playing the real-world equivalent of artillery only in Hearts of Iron. You wouldn't have much of anything else left. You wouldn't have logistics, you wouldn't have infantry, and you wouldn't have an armoured corps. You also wouldn't have administrators, so good luck getting anyone paid. And just like Russia's other combat arms, the artillery includes, let's just say, a variety of products, ranging from the very modern and world-beating to the things that have been packed in Cosmoline for just a few decades too many. Because we need to remember that Russian industry can and has produced some pretty complex weapon systems. And given the importance that Russia places on the artillery, you shouldn't be surprised to know that they have some systems which are generally comparable or superior to many Western and NATO systems. They've got some very long-range and guided rocket systems. They've got some very advanced self-propelled guns. The problem that the Russians have, as with many of their other advanced weapon systems, is the production runs of the very, very, very good stuff tends to be relatively limited. Their new generation multiple launch rocket systems, they've got a couple of hundred of them, and a limited production run of the guided and advanced munitions for them. The Mustar SM, which is the modernized version of the original gun, they've only got about 320 of them. It's a minority of the guns that they have in service that have been modernized to that standard, at least as of the 2021 figures. And finally, when you look about their newest, most modern gun, the Coalitia SV-12, maybe, prototype stage. Basically, this thing is the artillery equivalent of the Su-57, a really advanced, very capable system that really seems stuck for the moment in the prototype stage. But this is Russia. So they also have a whole bunch of museum pieces dating back as far as the early cold or even the Second World War. People have joked on Reddit and the news that they hope to see World War II era tanks coming out of storage. Sorry to say the Russians don't have any left for that purpose. There are no T-34s that are going to be appearing on the Ukrainian front. But you may still, if the war goes long enough, maybe get to see some World War II relics in action. They've got M1938 mortars, which were originally designed in 1938, D1 howitzers from 1943 onwards, and of course, if the figures are to be believed, still a small number, about 100, of the old BM-13 Katyusha itself, the classic, the weapon that was involved in pushing the Germans out of Ukraine during World War II. Nominally, at least some of those old systems are still in service, although I don't know what model and calibre. Now, when you think about this seriously, there are probably some pretty significant issues with bringing kit this old back into service. Do you still have ammo for it? Does anyone remember how to use it? And are World War II performance standards really up to the challenge of today where, you know, there are high Mars systems out there throwing GMLRS rockets around the place? Who knows? It's been a strange war. But most of the Russian arsenal sits squarely in between those two extremes. Not super modern guns like the Koalitsia, Not World War II era systems like the BM-13, but instead some of the products of the mid and late Cold War. Huge stocks of Soviet artillery. That graph there is very approximate, but what it charts there, in rough terms, is the number of artillery systems that are in service. Blue weapons are in service, and orange are weapons that are in reserve. The left-hand column is guns and weapon systems that were designed after the fall of the Soviet Union and manufactured after the fall of the Soviet Union. As you can see, All of the ones they have are in service, but there aren't a huge number of them. The middle column is weapons that were designed during the Soviet era. This makes up the majority of the arsenal, and most of those weapons are the towed guns that are in reserve, and on the right-hand side are weapons that were designed during World War II, and may have been produced afterwards but were designed during the World War II era, or indeed in some cases, even earlier. 
But most of the weapon systems, both in service and reserve, come from this Cold War era, at least in their design. The 2S3 Akatsi is one of the more common self-propelled guns, 850 in service, 1,000 in reserve. And by the way, for an army that repeatedly stresses just how manly it is, it sure is good that the Russians name a lot of their artillery pieces after damn flowers. Anyway, so they've also got the 2S12 guns, 700 in service, 1,000 in reserve. The BM-21, the famous Grad, I've got a picture of one there. This is a multi-tube rocket launch system. It's really designed to hit area targets, and there are 550 of these things in service, about 2,000 of them in reserve. And finally, the relatively modern Muster S, there's 536 of those guns in service, 150 older versions in reserve. My point here is that Russia has a ground-shattering, world-dominating artillery force that, in terms of numbers especially of weapons in reserves, dominates many of its opponents, but a lot of what is sitting in there in reserve is stuff that was produced in the Soviet Union, by the Soviet Union, to the standards of the Cold War era or the World War II era, not necessarily for the modern battlefield, and we'll talk about the implications of that a little bit later on. Now, Russia wasn't the only beneficiary of all the weapons left over from the fall of the Soviet Union. Ukraine has a very large artillery park of its own. In fact, if you'd compared it against just about any other European state before war broke out in February 24th, Ukraine would have dominated in terms of number of tubes and rocket launchers compared to just about anyone else on the continent, except Russia. They have a huge number of Soviet systems, more than 600 self-propelled guns, about 500 towed guns, and 354 MLRS systems, at least estimated according to Military Balance 2021. 81 of those rocket systems, by the way, are the very large, very powerful Asmersh 300mm rocket projectors. Now, like Russia, they've also got a couple of ancient pieces from the Cold War that they have pulled out of storage. The 2S7 Pion, which we will see a little bit of later. They had 83 of them, and we've seen a lot of evidence of them in service. So on paper, this is a very, very serious artillery force. But I'm not going to dwell on it the way I did with the Russians for a couple of reasons. And the biggest reason is that Ukraine isn't really limited by its number of guns or missile launchers. It's limited by how much ammunition it has to fire from them. A 2S7 Pion by itself, with 203mm shells, is an incredibly dangerous weapon capable of reaching out to 375 kilometers effectively, or 55 kilometers if it's got the right ammunition and fires at a full charge. But if you run out of ammunition, you're basically reduced to trying to run people over with an extremely slow-moving, unwieldy monster truck. You can have all the guns in the world, the best guns in the world, but if you've got no ammunition to fire from them, well, you've got 46 and a half tons of nothing. And that's part of the reason why NATO support for Ukraine has been so essential. Ukraine is basically trying to transition over to entirely new weapon systems mid-war, which is always something that's pretty challenging to do. Now, in the opening days of the war, NATO did tap on the shoulders of all of its former Warsaw Pact members, and they were able to drum up a whole bunch of old Soviet systems, so grads and various uh, SPGs like Akatsias. Those mostly came from the former Warsaw Pact countries, and a lot of people were able to find some supplies of 152mm shells, 122mm rockets, the kind of stuff that Ukraine needs to fire out of its old Soviet hand-me-downs. But now, as supplies of that start to run out, and we'll examine that issue more later, they are trying to standardise around new NATO systems, 155mm artillery guns, and 227mm rocket systems. So they've received more than 140 towed guns, 155mm. Those are mostly M777s from America, Canada, and Australia. They've also got a whole number of self-propelled guns from places like Norway, Germany, the Netherlands, etc. You can see a supply of them there, the Caesar guns from France, and 14 MLRS systems. These are multiple launch rocket systems are pledged, of which only four are known to be in the country at this time which means you end up with a force that operates both this, the best that American engineering can provide, and this fine example of Ukrainian local ingenuity. It's quite the diverse artillery park. So that's where Ukraine finds itself. It's got a relatively large park of Soviet gear, including a lot of stuff it captured from the Russians during the early stages of this war, but precious little ammunition to feed them. And then by contrast, it's got a relatively small number of NATO systems and plenty of ammunition to feed them, which leads to all sorts of interesting challenges. Anyway, that's a run-through of what the forces looked like before the war started. Let's have a quick look at how the artillery war has evolved. Because the fighting in Ukraine has evolved significantly over time. One of the only constants is that artillery has played a decisive role, on either side, through all stages of it. So in the opening stage of the war, we had the grand Russian thunder run towards Kyiv. 
Starting from their staging areas in Belarus, the Russians force a large number of light forces in the vanguard, followed by armour, and these press forward from their Belarusian staging areas to try and take the Ukrainian capital and a number of cities on that northern flank of Ukraine. In this stage of the war, the narrative focused very heavily on Javelin, Stugna, Enlor. These were the anti-tank guided missile systems that either Ukraine had or the West pushed to Ukraine as fast as possible in order to halt the Russian tanks. And we got a whole bunch of videos of tanks being ambushed with anti-tank guided missile teams and being steadily eroded on these long roads towards Kyiv. And we've talked about this grand stage of the Russian YOLO manoeuvre towards Kyiv before. The Russians in the vanguard, so the armoured vehicles, lacking enough dismounted infantry or fire support, found it extremely difficult to push through Ukrainian positions that were staffed with large numbers of infantry units that were carrying anti-tank guided missiles, at all the while having their logistics eroded by ambushing teams of territorial defence forces and Ukrainian special forces that were being called up and manoeuvred in order to attack the Russian supply lines. But having a look at a lot of the drone footage and filming from this era, as well as the comments of both Western analysts and commentators, as well as pro-Russian sources, it seems pretty clear that while Javelin and Stugna and Enlor on these missile systems were important in stopping these armoured thrusts, it wasn't them that actually caused the majority of the casualties. The majority of the casualties were caused by the artillery. See, in a lot of these cases, what appears to have happened is that the Russian artillery wasn't at the vanguard of the advance. That makes sense. You kind of don't want to stick your long-range guns at the absolute front of the advance force because, you know, they get picked off and ambushed and they're pretty vulnerable at close range. But as a result, what it meant was the Russian artillery was often out of range and unable to reply to Ukrainian batteries that were firing on Russian tanks that were bunched up in the vanguard after being held up by various Ukrainian positions. That could be an anti-tank guided missile team, it could be an entrenched position, it could be a mechanised unit of the Ukrainian army. Either way, the Russian army would be halted, and then the artillery would come in on the Ukrainian side to do a lot of the damage. And this makes sense, the Ukrainians were near Kyiv, they could call up territorial defence in very large numbers, supplies were easier to get to Kyiv than they were towards the Donbass, the Russians invaded during the mud season, which meant they were pretty much stuck on the road, and they ended up with that long logistical masterpiece that was the convoy to nowhere. It was perhaps the most mobile stage of the war to date. It was the moment for the Russian manoeuvre forces to shine. But it was also one of the first moments that seemed to confirm to us that it was very difficult for Russian manoeuvre elements to push through defended Ukrainian positions without extensive fire support. And in the early stages of the push on Kyiv, that fire support just wasn't available in large enough numbers. And so most of these grand Russian manoeuvres in the early war failed. They did take ground in the south of Ukraine, but in the Donbass and in the north, Russia either made no ground at all, very little ground, or was eventually forced to retreat, like they were around Sumy and Chernihiv and Kyiv itself. The airborne operations, the armoured thrust, the dashing war of manoeuvre didn't really work. And so what we've seen over time is that Russia falls back on its old tactics, and we see a movement towards a more static sort of warfare. Now, frontline movements are slow. People talk about Russian advances, but when they do, they're measuring advances in hundreds of metres or individual towns after the end of a week or individual population centres within an area. In Mariupol, the reporting would focus on the fall of individual buildings or blocks and the fighting over one particular industrial complex as of stars stretched on for seemingly weeks. This is not blitzkrieg, this is not deep battle, this is not manoeuvre warfare. This is bringing up artillery to pulverise positions again and again, probe them to see whether they've been weakened enough for your infantry to take them, and repeating the process of bashing your forehead against a position until the time when all of the defenders are either killed, wounded, or finally out of ammunition. And in that context, primacy passes away from the manoeuvre elements and towards fires. It passes towards the artillery. So now in Ukraine, what we see is slow, methodical Russian advances that are supported by massive barrages of concentrated artillery forces, including multiple launch rocket systems like the Grad, as well as large number of tubed artillery systems as well, that systemically reduce positions until they can finally be occupied. At the same time, we see the Ukrainian guns focused on counter-battery operations, trying to hold back the Russian superiority in raw firepower. It's not the sort of war that we've seen much of in recent years, and it's worth asking how it's come to evolve to this point. Why is the war looking like the war we see? 
And one of the key factors that goes into explaining why the artillery has become so important is the fact that aviation on both sides is relatively limited in terms of its ability to inflact the battlefield. I'm not saying aviation's useless, the Russians are still flying several hundred sorties a day. But when you look at it, the Air Force really isn't proving to be a decisive weapon on either side. One of the reasons for this is that both sides have pretty good air defence systems. They've inherited a lot of old Soviet hardware, which often has a very long range and makes it possible to basically make air support into areas of the front pretty damn dangerous. I've got a map there in the top right. And the biggest circle there is the range or the approximate range of the S-300 air defence system, which, which both Russia and Ukraine has. Russia even has some more modern systems with a longer range than that. So you can see with one of those systems, you can zone out air operations over a great area of the front. You compare that to the smaller circles you see within that. Those are the range, uh, the 24 kilometer ranges of an Akatsia self-propelled gun firing a rocket assisted projectile. So what you can see is you can put an air defense system pretty safely behind the lines and still make it dangerous to fly at high altitude over the combat zone, close enough to drop bombs or fire missiles or anything like that. Now, one way to evade that is to fly really, really low. And we've got a lot of evidence of both Russian and Ukrainian aircraft flying very, very low to the ground to avoid this sort of air defense system. The problem is down low, you've got shoulder-fired missiles, man pads, and Ukraine's been supplied with very large numbers of them. This is a problem for low-flying aircraft. It's also a particular problem for helicopters that would often go in and hunt down tanks, armored vehicles, were it not for these sort of air defense systems. So what you have is the Russians launching lots of sorties, but they're mostly only picking around the edges. They're attacking areas with limited air defenses, they're bombing right at the front at the extreme end of the Ukrainians' range, or they're flying very, very low. In fact, in some cases, we've seen a lot of videos on both sides of helicopters doing this weird maneuver where well behind the lines, they'll fly really low, they'll pitch up and they'll fire a volley of unguided rockets in a ballistic arc. This is not accurate. This is not efficient. They do this because it's too dangerous to actually get in direct line of sight of your targets and fire accurately. This is what they're doing in order to avoid being shot down by man pads. So when you have helicopters basically acting as airborne artillery, despite being incredibly expensive and that being a huge waste of the system, and you have most air sorties either being standoff cruise missile launches in the case of Russia's strategic bombers, or picking around the edges of Ukrainian defences, well, you need an alternative for fires. And you need that fire support, because one of the other features is when you're dealing with heavily entrenched positions, we're discovering that a relatively well-motivated, dug-in defending infantry force that has access to modern anti-tank missiles and man pads is pretty resistant to being pushed through by a force of tanks, particularly if that force of tanks doesn't have a great amount of quality dismounted infantry with it. And I've previously done a video on why Russia is pretty short on quality capable infantry to support its armoured pushes. Russia doesn't have the strong manoeuvre elements to push through very heavily dug in Ukrainian defences, so it needs something to even the odds. So the Air Force can't do the job. And with the Air Force out of operations, or at least limited in its operations, it's safer for big vulnerable artillery guns to be brought up. It's hard to hide artillery. They're big, they're dumb, they give off big distinctive muzzle flashes, they require piles of shells. Specifically when you're talking about towed guns in particular, they're usually, you would think, easy meat for aviation. But if aviation's been taken out of the fight, suddenly it's safe for the artillery to come out of play. And if the tanks and the infantry desperately need very large volumes of fire to be put on defended positions to weaken them so they can finally move forward, well, there's really only one option. You bring up the guns, you bring up a lot of the guns. And that's exactly what the Russians have done on a pretty massive scale, particularly in the Donbass. Estimates for Russian shells and rockets fired in the Donbass run a pretty wide range. You've seen minimum estimates based on reported Russian fire missions of around 7,000 rounds a day, all the way up to 60,000 rounds per day. Ukraine claims to be firing around 3,000 to 6,000 with a general 10 to 1 disadvantage against Russian systems in the Donbass. So we can go for a 30,000 to 60,000 figure here. And much of this firing appears to have been aimed at destroying heavily defended areas. Trench systems, fortifications, towns, cities, and zones. Mariupol was blasted to oblivion. Several Donetsk was basically leveled, and if you look at what Lysychansk looks like now, it also suffered very heavily. And if you see drone footage of the battlefields outside these areas, the trench systems, it's fields that are absolutely pockmarked with artillery rounds. 
But it's important not to portray the Russians just as dumb brutes who are shelling everything they can see. Russia is certainly doing area fire missions onto these defended areas, but they're also doing point attacks against specific targets using guided munitions. This is why a number of Russian commentators complain about the lack of drones, for example, because Russia has a guided artillery shell, Krasnopol, but it relies on laser designation, which you need a drone in order to do in order to make the round effective. So there's sort of a a mixed usage of Russian artillery here. Very large numbers of relatively inaccurate area shooting and some attempts to be more precise and take out very specific Ukrainian targets. And in some ways, the sheer weight of fire unleashed by the Russian army seems to have worked in some cases, to have done what doctrine suggested it could do. Ukrainian and pro-Russian sources in the so-called Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republic basically agree that Russian artillery has been critical in pushing the Ukrainians back from their positions in the Donbass, particularly around Severodonetsk and Lysychansk. The images from Mariupol, Severodonetsk, certainly support that. As I've said, images of mass destruction by artillery. If you look at some of the sources on the pro-Russian side, so we've talked about Girokin, aka Strelkov, before. Um, he's described the Russian gunners as absolutely vital in determining the outcome of the battles in Donetsk so far. He's got nothing but harsh words for the infantry forces and nothing but respect in many cases for the power of the defending Ukrainian infantry, but he said it's been the gunners that have saved the day time and time again. At the same time, whenever we see Ukrainian units suffering combat fatigue or complaining about being under-equipped, the point of stress, the point of concern, the thing that they complain about and ask for more of is more guns because the thing that is getting to them is the constant day-in, day-out mass shelling by Russian MLRS and Russian gun systems. Now, there is some evidence that this has put some strain on the Russian systems available in the area. They concentrated an awful lot of battalion tactical groups in the Donbass for the assault on Severodonetsk and Lysychansk. And as a result, we've seen older guns appear in larger and larger numbers, particularly being supplied to DNR and LPR. In any case, it's safe to say that of all the weapons that the Russians have brought to bear in order to try and defeat the Ukrainians on the field, the artillery has been by far the most successful. They've struggled to make much headway in the early days with airborne operations, tank thrusts, mechanized infantry attacks. They've had a lot more success, albeit very, 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 very slow success, through the use of methodical artillery tactics that would not have been out of place in the First World War. In some ways, there's evidence the Ukrainians have been using their artillery a little bit differently. They still are doing a bunch of conventional suppressive fires. We've seen some evidence of those, where they fire in support of their own units. But there has been a comparatively huge focus on counter-battery fire and servicing precision targets, as small as individual enemy batteries or individual enemy vehicles. And we can see that this is so central to Ukrainian strategy in a couple of ways. It's not just about the video evidence, it's about what they've been supplied with and what they ask for. Every time the Western allies have announced a supply of additional guns or ammunition to Ukraine, They've also announced a supply of weapon-locating radars, counter-battery radars, systems that are designed to detect incoming artillery rounds, do some math based on the trajectory the round is following, and tell you where the gun that fired that round probably is, so that you can put your gun on that target and service it right back, using your artillery to kill their artillery. Because with neither air force able to go in and clean up, that's basically what they're reduced to doing in a lot of cases. The Ukrainians have also been making maximum use of things like drones, superior communications equipment, superiority across the whole intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance sector. They're better at finding targets, and they're trying to hit targets precisely, with a main focus on neutering the power of the Russian artillery, because the Russian artillery is the primary threat to the Ukrainian defensive infantry. But it's important not to think that precision shooting is all that the Ukrainians are doing. They wouldn't be spending 6,000 rounds a day if that was all they were doing. These guys are using M777 howitzers and very large caliber, precise, long-range guns. But they're also using rocket launchers strapped to the back of Toyotas that are firing at general area targets. The Ukrainian artillery force, like the Russian force, is a mixed bag. It's just the emphasis of their mission that is tilted more heavily towards targets in the operational depth and things that enable the Russian artillery to do its job. Unfortunately for Russia, Ukraine has a little bit more in terms of missile launches than just rockets strapped to the back of a Toyota Hilux. Because Toyotas are cool, but, you know, Uncle Sam has some other things up his sleeve. One weapon system that Ukraine has begged for longer and harder than just about any other is long-range precision rocket artillery. 
In late June, they finally got their wish when the first high-mobility artillery rocket systems from the United States arrived in country. As far as we can tell, there are only four of these systems active. It's basically a wheel chassis, a truck if you like, with a six-pack of rockets on the back. But it's the rockets themselves that are special. After all, everyone's got rocket artillery. Russia has ungodly amounts of rocket artillery. So does Ukraine. What makes the HIMARS that have been sent there different is that every single rocket we believe that's been provided is a GMLRS rocket. These are precision weapons with GPS guidance that are capable of reaching out 80 plus kilometers into the rear areas behind enemy lines. And as soon as they arrived, Ukraine started going ham with the damn things. And the first target, of course, has been Russian ammunition depots, holding all of the rounds for those thousands of guns that the Russians have been relying on in order to make their offense possible. I don't like the term game-changing weapon. I included it in my myth-busting video for a reason. And I don't think four HIMARS systems do qualify as a game-changer. But they've certainly unlocked some new options for the Ukrainians and had an immediate impact on the Russians who have started seeing their ammunition depots go off like everyone suddenly had a chronic smoking habit. And it's kind of hard to debate the fact that these things have had an immediate impact. Zelensky's gone out and said thank you more please in a way that he hasn't for just about any other weapon system. We've got video evidence and photos, I'll show you some in a moment, of these Russian depots exploding in spectacular fashion. We've got pro-Russian sources like Strokov going out there and specifically calling out the fact that the enemy has now adopted a new strategy, the destruction by rocket artillery of important rear facilities of the armed forces of the Russian Federation. So what Ukrainians are doing is they're driving these things around at night, exploiting the fact that they're mobile, firing them from their limits of their range, and using them to eliminate critical Russian targets behind the lines. And frankly, the Russian depots have been exploding so frequently and so often that I'm not convinced the Ukrainian crews actually sleep. In one day, five warehouses of artillery ammunition of the armed forces of the Russian Federation and DNR LPR were destroyed, presumably by HIMARS strikes, according to Strokov. We have video evidence of more than half a dozen ammunition depots specifically, and we suspect as many as 20 sites having been destroyed so far small and large concentrations of ammunition. One of the targets that was hit in Donetsk was apparently exploding for 20 odd minutes. Another one exploded so intensely that it evaporated a large section of the town around it. We've been able to confirm a lot of these too using the FIRM system. So NASA has a satellite system that's usually used for tracking wildfires. And as an Australian, I can only applaud this. Bushfires are basically our national enemy, and the development of satellite-based systems in order to counter them, that just seems like the kind of natural overkill that as an Aussie I can get behind. But when an ammunition depot goes up or a large artillery barrage takes place, the satellite kind of can't tell the difference between a wildfire and a massive artillery barrage or a burning artillery depot. So people have been using this open source satellite system to confirm that, yeah, there's a bloody big fire right where we thought that ammunition depot was. Now, of course, the Russians have claimed to have already destroyed half these systems, but I'll show you the video that they use as proof later on, which to me looks like it pretty clearly shows them destroying a bush and maybe some sort of truck. Anyway, we'll look at that later. And the Ukrainians continue to post images of these weapons being fired. And of course, air bases and ammo dumps continue to explode. It's kind of hard to sustain an artillery-led offensive if your ammunition dumps keep exploding. And again, Ukraine's currently got four of these systems. Poland's talking about buying 500. Now, as well as the HIMARS pattern of coordinated arson across Russian rear areas, there's another feature I wanted to call out before we sum up the war to date, and that's the omnipresence of drone spotting on both sides, but particularly in use by the Ukrainians. In an era where it seems people can get pretty accurate with artillery systems using either guided ammunition or very good target reference points, well-trained gunners, and proper correction, being able to see your opponent is critical. And we've seen drones used for this role that was traditionally done by forward artillery observers on a massive scale. Drone footage of artillery strikes replaced footage of anti-tank missile ambushes as the war's going on, as basically like the dominant visual evidence of the war that's going on day to day. What you've seen, which is quite interesting from a procurement and force design perspective, is that increasingly we're seeing evidence that the Ukrainians in particular, but to a degree also the Russians, are devolving the duty of spotting down to the battery or even the individual gun level, with artillery units using their own drones to augment or replace spotters to find their own targets, coordinate their own fires, and then correct their own fires. The Russian sources as well, the number that I was able to read on Telegram, 
talk very heavily about the importance, this is true of Russian journalists, of DNLPR sources, and a number of others, of the importance of getting as many artillery spotting drones as possible and identifying drones that can laser designate for Krasnopol rounds or coordinate and spot for artillery fires as absolutely critical for how the war is going to go on. The Ukrainians do have an advantage in many ways with this sort of drone spotted shooting. For one, that they can rely on known target reference points. They're the defenders, which means that Ukraine has had many, many years since 2014 to measure distances, identify potential gun positions, identify geographical features, and pre-decide target reference points. So if they see a bend in the road, they've already done the calculation on how to hit that bend in the road or how to adjust from it. They know how to use their visual cues better because they're the defender. They also have a reasonable supply of very accurate artillery systems. The M777 is more accurate than many of the Soviet systems. It also has a larger bursting charge, so it's more tolerant of misses than many of the Soviet systems. And of course, now they have HIMARS and precision-guided rockets as well. So Ukraine has an advantage in this sort of precision shooting, not just reducing entire areas, but firing at individual concentrations of vehicles, or in many cases, individual vehicles. But the Russians also have tools available to them and are calling for more. So with all that said, what's the actual balance of the artillery duel at the moment? Is it a completely one-way fight in which the Russians are basically pacing the Ukrainians? Have the Ukrainians suddenly taken the lead thanks to the introduction of four advanced rocket launcher systems from Uncle Sam? Well, let's have a look at each front individually because they each tell a slightly different story. In the Donbass itself, everyone on both sides agrees that Russia continues to enjoy a crushing artillery advantage. The figure of 10 to 1 is often thrown out by Ukrainian sources, and the Russians in the Donbass are equally complementary of their artillery and the advantages that they enjoy. When we look at the firm's data, so you've got a map there to the right. Those dots are basically what the NASA fire detection satellites are identifying as fires. But in almost every case in Ukraine at the moment, those aren't people like messing up on their smoko break. Those are concentrations of artillery fire that you're seeing. So what you're seeing is a lot more shells landing in the Ukrainian controlled zones and relatively few strikes in the Russian controlled zones. The Russians are attempting to fire on defensive positions, trench lines, the ridges, defending some of these cities while the Ukrainians are focused on targeting areas in the Russian rear. So those might be artillery batteries, those might be supply areas, targets that might be used to slow down the Russian offensive rather than targeting Russian units right at the absolute extreme of the line. So it's not that there is no Ukrainian fire. We can see those dots on the Russian side there. There's evidence of Ukrainian counter-battery efforts being made in this area. But the Russians enjoy pretty clear crushing artillery superiority in this area, which they're probably going to rely on if they want to move on to try and take Sivesk. Now, if you look at the satellite data and also the reporting that's coming out of the Kherson region by comparison, it's actually a little bit more balanced. There's still a preponderance of Russian fires into the Ukrainian frontline areas. You can see those concentrations. This is, I think, 6th June, but this is fairly representative of the days that have gone over the last week or so. But at the same time, Ukraine's also firing into Russian forward areas, and we've seen shallow attempts at Ukrainian offensives here that haven't really gone anywhere recently. But certainly in terms of the artillery exchange, the data we have available suggests that it might be a little bit more evenly matched here. Ukrainians also on the Kherson front have had a number of deep strikes where they fire at targets well into the operational depth, airfields, ammo dumps. You can see some of those long-distance strikes in the bottom corner of the map there. The Izium Front is interesting because it really depends on who you ask. Some of the ostensibly pro-Russian but a little bit more negative sources, so the Strelkovs of the world, actually argue that in some parts of the Izium Front, the Russian artillery is in some ways outmatched by its Ukrainian equivalent. And you can see evidence in the firm's data here of a lot of Ukrainian strikes that are landing well behind the lines, attacking positions near Izium, which is one of the key Russian logistical bases supporting the offensive further south. At the same time, the number of Russian bombardments of the actual Ukrainian areas is much lighter in the Izium area historically, at least over the last week or so, than it is in other areas, like Kherson and like the Donbass. And I need to stress here, we're using very limited information to try and make these observations. We've got a combination of a satellite system that was designed to detect wildfires that we're repurposing to detect artillery, with what people are posting on Telegram on both sides and what video evidence we're able to get out. So we have images of things blowing up around Izium. We have people on the pro-Russian side complaining about the situation around Izium. 
but saying that they're basically still able to hold the Ukrainians in place. I mean, the alternative is that maybe there are just a whole bunch of Russians walking around the forests and ammunition depots carrying canisters of gasoline and smoking. I don't know. Maybe they have really lap safety standards. But I'm going to go with the assumption, until proven otherwise, that it's probably the Ukrainians shelling them. So that's what the war looks like so far. Crushing Russian advantages in the Donbass, which they have used to level towns and defensive positions in order to try and reclaim some momentum. And it's been successful in Sverodonetsk, Papasna, and in Lysychansk. At the same time, there are other areas of the front where the Ukrainians enjoy a little bit more of a parity when it comes to artillery systems, very heavily reliant on their new M777 and other 155mm self-propelled guns and systems. And at the same time, there are four very, very motivated artillery rocket system crews, I presume drinking a lot of energy drinks, blowing up every strategic target they can find, who see every pile of 152mm shells as something just begging for their personal attention. How long can this be sustained? Because that's the, if that's the war as it stands, my question then, my contribution essentially becomes, how does this come together in terms of procurement, in terms of maintenance, logistics and sustainment, and what lessons can we take away from it so far? The first point I want to make here is that guns themselves are essentially consumables, or specifically, the barrels of guns are consumables. If you think about what an artillery system does, you're detonating an explosive mixture of extremely hot propellant gases in order to throw a hunk of metal out of the end of a metal tube at very, very, very high speed. At the same time, in order to make sure that round is accurate, the inside of your gun has very fine rifling to make sure that the round is spinning and stabilized and goes roughly where you want to go. Now, modern guns are not in fact made of adamantium, which means that over time, you fire enough rounds and that rifling starts to wear down. As a result, as you start to lose that rifling and as your barrel starts to wear out, you start to lose accuracy. And even worse than that, you fire enough charges, eventually you can also get things like metal fatigue and induced failures that cause a gun not so much to be inaccurate as to just, you know, do things like blow up in your face, which is generally considered a suboptimal outcome for an artillery crew. Now, a lot of artillery systems are loaded in two parts. You put the shell in, which is the thing you want to throw at the enemy that lands and goes boom or explodes in the air. And then behind it, you load the propellant, which is the thing that detonates in the barrel. You don't want the shell to detonate in the barrel. That's a bad day. You want the propellant to detonate, generate hot gases, and throw your round out the barrel. If you're going a relatively short distance, you can load less propellant. If you're firing the thing to the absolute limit as fits the range, you're packing that thing to the gills with propellant and firing it at the maximum pressure level it can. This is why the lifetime of a gun barrel is usually measured in effective full charges. It means you can shoot more rounds out of it before it wears out if you're only firing short distances. Uh, Artillery cannons safe numbers range from maybe 1 to 2,000 effective full charge rounds. This is why there's a lot of reporting that Canada is sending replacement artillery barrels to Ukraine. This is why there's reporting that a lot of Ukraine's M777 guns, they haven't been destroyed, but they are in for repairs because they've fired so many rounds that their barrel life has been exceeded. You see, if you look at the supplies that uh, America declared that it was sending of guns, and same for Canada and Australia, a number of rounds that were sent was more than could be fired from the guns that were sent before their barrels ran out. They sent more ammunition than they did guns, relatively speaking. Those guns now need to be rebarreled, or they lose their accuracy, which is their biggest advantage, their range and their accuracy. And since they're firing at the maximum extent of their range most of the time, you imagine, they're probably going to wear their barrels faster than if they were engaging at a closer distance. All of this is why I get really surprised at the way uh, pro-Russian commentators on things like Twitter and YouTube respond when estimates come up of how many rounds of ammunition Russia is firing per day. Uh, In a number of cases, I've seen videos from Western media saying Russia is firing, say, 20,000 rounds of artillery ammunition per day. And the pro-Russian commentators race in to say, no, 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 they're firing 60,000 rounds a day, Westoid. That's a bad thing. You see... What you want to do, and maybe this is just the economics and logistics hat coming through a little too much, is you want to achieve as much as possible while firing as few rounds as possible. Because every round you fire is one, a round that you don't get back. It's a round that you have to replace. And secondly, it's a little bit of lifetime of your barrel that's been worn away you'll never get back. We know how much ground the Russians have taken. We've seen them take several Donetsk and Lysychansk. We've seen the slow gains in the Donbass. We also have Ukrainian declarations around casualty rates, so we know that too. Actually, what the Russians should be wanting to say is they're firing relatively few rounds, that they're being accurate, they're achieving this with less. 
60,000 rounds is actually kind of problematic. I mean, let's assume for a moment that half of those rounds are coming from howitzers, and let's give the Russian guns the benefit of the doubt and give them a 2,000 round barrel life, and assume that all of those barrels were factory fresh, clean as a baby's bum, before they went into service in the Ukraine war. Which is odd considering a lot of these guns are from the Soviet era or a late 90s and early 2000s manufacturer in nature. But let's, let's give them all of those assumptions. That still means that the Russians are burning out 15 guns a day. Which is pretty significant because yes, they have all of those guns in reserve, all those towed guns in reserve. What they don't have is an infinite supply of modern artillery systems, the Mustard S and the other more precise, more capable systems. Uh, You can't just replace everything with towed artillery, or you can, but you lose an awful lot of capability. And if you're burning out these barrels, one of two things is going to happen. Either you have to rebarrel the gun, and you need to have a spare barrel ready for it, or you're losing accuracy on the system, or you're replacing it with a less accurate system in general. And as we'll talk about in a moment, accuracy really, really matters. As for how much capacity the Russians have to rebore guns, repair them, replace barrels, that's pretty unknown. What we do know is that the bare minimum, this is a logistics drain. It's almost as effective as the Ukrainians destroying 15 guns a day, albeit without destroying the crews in the process, or it leads to significant degradation in the accuracy and capability of the Russian artillery force over time. The same way it's reduced the capability of the Ukrainian artillery force by forcing them to send a number of their M777s back to have new barrel replacements fitted. And when I say accuracy matters, that's not just some sort of technological fetishism where I want to buy the most expensive guided munitions possible. A lot of people who support the ostensible Russian doctrine, it's more of a stereotype than anything. The idea that they'll just level entire towns and fire massive artillery barrages basically say that, well, you know, the accuracy doesn't really matter. What you need is lots of guns, just fire more rounds. The problem is when you're talking about accuracy and seps and kill probabilities, the math gets really, really ugly really quickly if you're trying to attack specific targets or infantry and units in fortified positions like trench lines. Remember, on the first day of the Somme, the British fired something like one and a half million shells, and then they went over the top and they all got slaughtered. And that's because if those one and a half million shells are not accurate and are not capable of killing people that are deep in their fortifications, they're wasted. It's because missing is really bad. You don't get points for how many trees and how many clumps of grass you kill. Really degrading your enemy's military capability is kind of what the artillery is aiming to do. I mean, there's some utility in terms of suppressing fire, scaring people with rounds going off around them, but ideally you want to hit and you want to cause some damage. To give an illustration of the math for a moment, if you're talking about something like a 122mm rocket, so something that might come out of the grad, some that roughly speaking might have a 21 metre kill radius and land anywhere in a 400 by 400 metre box. It doesn't sound like something you want to do, but if you stand somewhere in that 400 by 400 box and that grad fires a full salvo of 40 rockets, statistically speaking, there's a good chance that you end up fine. And while people often want to point out that artillery can have very, very large wounding radii, like an artillery round rounding within 50 metres view can kill you, out to 150 metres, there might be a very serious shrapnel effect. Those are just illustrative numbers that are in the broad area of correct. The problem is, that's if you're an infantryman standing in the open. If you're in a fortification or a building, or if you're a hard target, then that starts cutting down dramatically. So, for example, what if you've mastered that old uh, human technique of digging? The Ukrainians have had years since 2014 to dig relatively intricate tent systems. They dig themselves into the basements of buildings. They prepare detailed defensive positions, or maybe they're just inside armoured vehicles. Suddenly hitting within 25, within 50, within 100 metres isn't really good enough anymore. If someone's deep in a dugout, we saw this in the First World War, a heavy artillery piece needs to hit relatively close to a trench to kill someone who's buried deep in a dugout. So suddenly accuracy becomes really important if we're doing things like engaging individual tanks or individual strong points. One way to measure accuracy here is to use a measure called Circular Error Probable, CEP. More often used for missiles, but it's appropriate for certain artillery weapons as well. Basically, a SEP is the radius within which half of your rounds are going to land. So if you have a 5 metre SEP, half of your rounds are going to land within 5 metres of your aiming point, and half of them are going to land outside that. 
If your round has a 5 meter circular error probable and it will kill anything within 5 meters once you account for how hard the target is, that means you're probably going to have to fire two rounds in order to reliably hit the target and kill it. Start talking about SEPs in the hundreds of meters and you start talking about four digit figures of shells or missiles landing in order to actually secure a kill on the target that you're aiming for. It's kind of hard to kill something if you can't hit it, which is why accuracy matters and burning out your barrel is a really bad idea if you're going to be engaging anything smaller than a town or a city. Now, there's obviously more to it than this. Like, there's a lot more that goes into accuracy for artillery than just the barrel and the specifications of the system. A lot matters in terms of how accurate the original call for fire is. Have they given you the correct coordinates? Where is the aiming point? Is the aiming point correct? And if the aiming point is correct, How accurate is the lay? Have the crew accurately pointed the gun at the laying point in order to fire their rounds and basically turn it over to the accuracy of the gun? But the fundamental point here is that accuracy really does matter and wearing out your barrels is one way to destroy your accuracy. The other reason accuracy really matters is because it means you're more likely to get a round on early. And most of the casualties in artillery bombardments historically, this is true for Korea, for the Second World War, to an extent what we can tell from the First World War, is that most casualties of artillery barrages occur in the opening stages of the artillery barrage. This is because human beings are generally not stupid. If artillery rounds start splashing around them, human beings do things like duck, go to ground, hide behind something, jump into an armoured vehicle, jump in a ditch, and all of this massively lowers the kill radius of the rounds falling around them and decreases the reality of the volley. You give people a couple of seconds to run for cover, and all of a sudden they're safe. This is why something like uh, the Panzer Hobitsen from Germany have a firing mode where you can fire multiple rounds in the air on different trajectories so they all land at the same time. You're maximizing the number of rounds that are landing during that window of vulnerability in the opening stages of your course of fire. So yes, you can compensate for a lack of accuracy by using more guns. But depending on what you're shooting at, it can be a lot more guns and a lot more ammo. And the more guns and ammo you bring up, the faster you burn barrels, the faster you burn ammo, and the worse you degrade your ability to do precision fires in the future. So if I was a Russian propagandist looking at the way the battlefield's going, I'd be saying I was firing 3,000 rounds a day. That's it. I'm firing as many as the Ukrainians are, and I'm still achieving my tactical objectives. 60,000 rounds per day from a logistical perspective is kind of worrying. Then there's the ammunition question. And here, Russia is undoubtedly in a better space than the considerations around barrel life, where we have questions over their ability to rebore and replace these things quickly. We know Russia is sitting on very, 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 very large stockpiles of Soviet-era ammunition, which is what most of their weapons fire, other than the really advanced precision-guided or very, very modern extended range stuff. Open source information on just how much ammo? Nah, not, not really there but it's measured in millions upon millions of tons of stuff piled up in depots all the way from Western Russia out to Siberia. Russia also retains the ability to produce 152mm shells, and I can't think of any reason they wouldn't be able to scale up production of dumb 152mm ammunition, despite being cut off from technology imports from abroad. It's not that complex to build a dumb shell. The Russian Empire during World War I was able to mass produce the things, and while yes, modern artillery ammunition, when you look at the fusing and the structure, is a little more more complicated, Russian industry is also more complicated and advanced than it was during the days of the Tsar. There are some points where you might be concerned if you were the Russians, though, that are worth noting, although these are mostly speculative in nature. The first is we have seen evidence that Russia is pulling ammunition out of Belarusian warehouses and shipping it to Belgorod to support the Donbass front. Now, this might just be a logistical workaround, or it might also be because Russia feels the need to draw on Belarus's stocks, because Belarus also has millions of tons of old 152mm ammunition lying around as well. At the same time, there's also a question mark over Russia's ability to mass-produce its more advanced ammo. These huge Soviet stockpiles are probably not the super long-range rocket-assisted projectiles that give these artillery systems their maximum range. Everyone always talks about the maximum range of these systems. Maximum range is what you get when you're using an artillery round with a rocket in the base of it to give it extra distance, something with a little bit more oomph, and something that's really going to degrade the barrel life. They also may not be able to mass-produce things like Krasnopol, 
or their modern GLONASS and other forms of guided rockets for their rocket artillery. We don't know what their productive capacity is. We just know that when we have seen other Russian high-tech products like drones, they've often been full of Western components. So there's a big question mark over what Russia can produce in sort of the more high technology category. The, the final caveat I'll add is a lot of this ammunition, we've got evidence is stored like shit. I'll, I'll show you some photos later of some Russian depots for 125 millimeter tank ammunition. It's kind of horrific. It will give conniptions to most people who have ever worked in an armory or a logistics context. But all of that, I think we can leave aside and say this. It's a relatively safe assumption that Russia has, to put it in scientific terms, a shit ton of ammo to fire from its artillery guns, and it's unlikely that the Ukrainians can win this thing by simply tanking it until they run out of rounds. Unless, that is, they start using their HIMARS systems to detonate all the ammunition that happens to be at the front, because all the ammunition in the world doesn't help you if the ammo dump is in Siberia and the guns are in the Donbass. Ukraine's ammunition supply for its old Soviet-era guns, by contrast, is pretty dire. There's a reason I didn't focus too much on counting tubes for Ukraine, as I said. It's because ammunition constrains their ability to be useful far more than the number of guns themselves. There's a secondary focus on barrel life, because there's an open question over how quickly Ukraine really could rebarrel all of its guns once it starts to wear them out. But ammunition seems to be the more immediate problem. The problem is the biggest stores of 152mm ammo and 122mm ammo, the stuff that they really need, they've already bought up a lot of the easily available supplies that were in Eastern Europe. Ukraine started the war with about 300,000 rounds, I've seen the estimates in terms of their artillery ammunition, and they've received perhaps a few hundred thousand more from the former Warsaw Pact nations, so Poland, Bulgaria, Romania, Czechia, Slovakia, etc. A lot of those countries used to use guns of that calibre, some still have guns of that calibre, and aid has flown in terms of the ammunition. NATO has also turned to the Warsaw Pact states to try and manufacture replacements or supply replacements. Bulgaria, for example, has factories capable of producing 152mm ammo. The Romanians are talking about reactivating some of their old production capacity as well, stuff that's been largely dormant for decades. Finland has a large stock of stuff that's in some of the relevant Soviet calibers and a relatively large artillery park. But there's no possibility that the production rates in Eastern Europe, the former Warsaw Pact states, is going to be anything like sufficient to run Ukraine's guns at the Russian rate of firing anytime soon. We're talking about production rates that might, over the course of a month, give Ukraine the amount of ammunition that it was originally firing off in the course of a day, at least before things ramp up a little bit. Although if you do want to go see the shopping page for some Bulgarian 152mm ammo, well, there you are, a lovely page in English, just in case you're buying. Now, there are very large supplies of ammunition for these guns elsewhere in the world. The problem is the largest stockpile of ammunition and production other than Russia that I'm aware of is China, and I doubt China is going to be in the mood to ship very large amounts of artillery ammunition to Ukraine to fire at Russia. Instead, when it comes to Ukraine's legacy arsenal, it's basically going to become a game of how much can Eastern Europe and the former Warsaw Pact states and Finland and countries like that supply in order to keep Ukraine's old guns firing long enough for it to receive sufficient supplies of replacement NATO hardware to keep it sustainable in the longer term. Efforts that are notably hampered by the fact that long before this war broke out, back in 2021 and in some cases earlier, there were often cases of suspected sabotage in ammunition depots in Eastern Europe that held large stocks of 152 and other sorts of Soviet ammo. Suspicious, that. For now, the situation's kind of reversed when it comes to Ukraine's NATO guns, at least according to uh, Ukrainian government sources, and also just logic looking at what's been supplied. Ukraine is saying it has more than enough 155mm ammo, it needs more guns. So it has too many Soviet guns and too little Soviet ammo, it has a lot of NATO ammunition and not enough NATO guns, so that's obviously going to have to ramp up over time in order to keep the Ukrainians in the artillery fight. Arm supply packages so far, as I've said, have usually included more rounds with guns than the barrels of those guns can handle. There's also been a mixture of basic um, 155mm rounds, extended range 155mm projectiles, so things that can really reach out and touch someone, and a few of the, the special ones, the, uh, the guided shells. So Excalibur for the 155mm guns. America hasn't said how many of these it's provided. Canada was actually the first power to come out and say outright that it had provided these. 
Now, I'm not sure whether they felt the need to apologise to the Russian embassy after doing so, but I'm sure the Ukrainians don't particularly mind either way, as long as the shells come through. This is basically a 155mm shell with a guidance kit. It can be very, very accurate, down to a couple of metres, and it can fire out to something like 40 kilometres. At the same time, when we're talking about the 227mm rocket systems like HIMARS, and then eventually from Germany you'll have the Mars system and the M270 from the UK, Mars and the M270 are basically the same. This has been entirely guided ammo so far, GMLRS rockets, which are not the best and longest range rockets that the um, Americans could have provided, but certainly they're doing the job out to a distance of 80, 85 kilometers. I've certainly seen questions asked as to whether or not NATO can sustain ammunition supplies to Ukraine uh, when it comes particularly to 155mm rounds and to rockets. The answer initially, much as when you dismiss the Russian situation saying they have way too many 152mm rounds, we shouldn't worry about it. For now, NATO has more than enough 155mm rounds to go around. There are pre-positioned stocks around the world for the United States in case of a contingency, plus an awful lot of NATO nations use it and have ammunition available. The question really is around production rates if this thing stretches to the point that it does start to strain stockpiles. The Americans were purchasing, it varies year to year, but if you look at purchasing records, about 100,000 rounds of 155mm ammo is not out of place for the last couple of years. Some years it's lower, some years it's higher. That's a mixture of dumb shells and guided shells. Obviously, if the Ukrainians want to fire 6,000, 7,000, 8,000, 9,000, 10,000 rounds per day, then that's not enough, and there's going to have to be some sort of ammunition ramp up, particularly if the Americans don't want to run down their stocks. If you are firing 10,000 rounds per day, which is a sixth of the upper end of the claimed Russian amount, you're going to need to more than treble the average American production, or at least the ballpark American production figure you've got there. But for the moment, in terms of feeding the guns that Ukraine has, ammunition is not really a problem for NATO. It's the logistics of shipping it and also onlining new guns and getting the Ukrainians more systems that can use this stuff. So that's the forces and the overview of the war to date, and some of the challenges they're facing in logistical terms. I'm now going to zoom out. I'm going to look at this from more of an external perspective, and just as we did for the tank video, for the reservist video, and for the drone video, we're going to look at some of the lessons that the rest of the world might be tentatively able to take looking at the Ukrainian experience so far, and how that might impact decisions for our own armed forces. Bear in mind again, Information is highly imperfect, the fog of war is real, and there's also no guarantee that the next war will be like the Ukrainian-Russian war. You need to be very careful to not pivot your entire defence policy in order to prepare for a conflict that may not repeat. But let's get into it. And the first lesson, and the one that doesn't surprise anyone in the room, hopefully, is ammunition consumption. Because this seems to have surprised us in Ukraine, I don't know why this always surprises us. Militaries always seem to be shocked and alarmed by just how quickly they go through their critical ammunition stocks when a major war breaks out. There was a UK war game that went on some years ago, I'll find the reference for that one, where I believe they ran out of critical ammunition supplies after about eight days into what was planned to be a 10-day exercise. We just often seem to forget that when a war is on, people tend to shoot at each other pretty damn often. I mean, heck, if you want to Katerov's Chechens, you don't even need to shoot at anyone. You can just shoot at unoccupied buildings, trees, fields, you know, anything for the gram. The war in Ukraine has absorbed a tremendous amount of ammunition. Four months of conflict was enough to eat away Ukraine's entire ready stockpile of 152mm ammo and also make a very deep gash into what most of Europe had left over. At the same time, the Russian tactics are only sustainable because the Soviet Union was a thing and left its trash lying around. The Soviet Union was obsessed with producing huge quantities of artillery, artillery ammunition, tanks, everything, getting ready for that final throwdown with NATO. Perhaps because the Soviet Union understood that if there was going to be a major conventional conflict in Europe, it would absorb rounds by the millions relatively quickly. So one of the lessons we probably need to take from this is if we expect there to be a conventional fight between relatively well-matched nations, then there need to be realistic projections about ammunition consumption that support that. Preferably, militaries should be able to fight for more than a couple of months before they run out of everything, including the critical supply being artillery ammo. And to this should be added an understanding that you can't just turn industry on in an emergency. You can't just buy 100,000 shells or 50,000 shells every year for 20 years 
and then suddenly go to your armament industry and say, I would like 3 million rounds this year, please. It takes time to onboard people, to prepare machinery, to invest the capital, to train everyone, get the production cycle running, bring in your subcontractors, and get production ramped up. Yes, artillery ammunition is often less complicated than things like precision-guided javelins, for example. But it's still pretty complex to manufacture, especially when you're talking about the best ammunition literally being guided munitions. It highlights the importance of stockpiling, not just building up large numbers of platforms. It's not enough to have large numbers of guns, large numbers of MLRS systems. You need to have the ammunition to fire out of them. Otherwise, as I said before, you're down to monster trucks and trying to run people over. It also, I think, highlights the importance of standardization and interoperability, which is one of NATO's great strengths. Ukraine is having great difficulty because it started the war with non-NATO equipment. Now, NATO powers are able to very freely share their artillery stockpiles. If one nation gets into trouble, they can potentially draw on or purchase from Uncle Sam's stockpiles or the UK stockpiles or France or Germany's stockpiles in order to make ends meet until production can ramp up. Supplying Ukraine has been very, very hard because they don't use the same kit as everyone else in Europe. And trying to convert them over to NATO kit mid-conflict has been a real challenge. So really, I think this is a vindication for standardization of calibers and equipment as much as possible across allies, so that it means you have a larger base of stored resources to draw on in the event of a crisis before you start to run low. The second thing I want to call out is the absolute importance of intelligence, of surveillance, of reconnaissance, particularly the use of drones in order to enable some very, very effective usage of artillery. In particular, we've seen, like I said before, massive use of artillery spotter drones used to spot for fires, correct for fires. It's just easier. Compare a drone to a forward observer on the ground. A forward observer on the ground is on the ground. They may not even be six foot tall, which limits how far out to the horizon they can see. And they're also not very disposable. They tend to have people protecting them because if they're shot, well, you're not just down a spotter, you're down the person that the spotter was. Drones are disposable, have much better views. They have features that are not included in your average human being, like, you know, zoom vision or potentially thermal or laser designators, and they can potentially be tasked down to the battery or even individual gun level. At the same time, this environment has huge numbers of counter-battery radars and precision-guided munitions that basically mean this is the new maxim, at least to an extent, in some of the battles in Ukraine. If you can find it through the use of drones or whatever, If you have the right weapon system there, you can probably kill it. You can get pretty accurate. The Ukrainians and the Russians are both showing. You can occasionally get pretty accurate with even conventional gun artillery if it's properly specced and uses the right ammo and a really good crew. And if you use precision-guided munitions, well, you end up being those guys with the high mass systems running rings around everyone and doing collective arson throughout the strategic depths of the Russian line. This also kind of becomes a a test for the traditional towed guns, because while there's a lot of fanfare around the M777, with the advent of accurate fire coming in uh, in counter-battery form, the emphasis on being able to move a gun very quickly, so to scoot and shoot, to fire rounds and then move, and also to survive near misses means that an armoured self-propelled vehicle with inbuilt computers, which lets it lay the gun quickly, which is accurate, which can maybe do multiple rounds simultaneous impact and then book it rather than, you know, connecting the gun to a prime mover and running, and also has armor, so it might survive more of a near miss than the squishy gunners of an M777 or a Russian towed gun might. So I think there is a vindication of the self-propelled gun concept, but again, we're going to need a lot of battlefield assessment and casualty studies in order to determine the extent to which that's true. But I do note that Ukraine is receiving a lot of self-propelled guns from the West, not just towed howitzers, but also M109 self-propelled guns, Panzer Halbitzen, etc. Of course, towed guns do have some advantages. I think most helicopters would really struggle to lift, for example, uh, a Panzer Halbitzen 2000, whereas an M777 is obviously very mobile. Right now, we've got a lot of cases of NATO training Ukrainians on NATO systems, but I strongly suspect that when this war is over, there'll be a lot of pressure to have Ukrainians train NATO operatives on the tactics and techniques that they have developed for employing artillery in this sort of fighting. Because it's been a very, very, very long time since NATO employed artillery against a peer adversary on any scale, and certainly the last time they did that, all these modern tools, precision-guided munitions and and drones, were not available. 
The next point I'd count more as a, a hot take as opposed to a determined lesson learned. It's one I personally raise an eyebrow at. When the Ukrainians asked for uh, heavy weapon resupply, they said they needed 1,000 howitzers and 500 new MLR systems, at which point everyone looked around NATO and was like, crap, only the Americans really have that number. And this led to the question of, well, has NATO neglected the artillery? Is NATO massively undergunned? The one thing I'll say here is that NATO militaries are not configured like the Russian military. They are not primarily artillery forces. And the war in Ukraine has really denied the role of one of the key traditional parts of most NATO countries' warfighting doctrine. The Air Force. America and allied nations invest really large resources in very large air forces that are designed to crack open enemy air defenses, range out over enemy targets, establish air dominance, and then start pounding everything into submission. We saw it in Desert Storm in 91, we saw it in 2003, and the plan would certainly be to do it again in most sort of conflicts. While I'm sure there are some angry Marines in the audience who wish the Corps still did bayonet charges on a regular basis, American warfighting doctrine in general abhors the idea of fighting fair. If it can be bombed from the air or destroyed at long distance using precision-guided cruise missiles or long-range strike capabilities, then that's what they're going to do. There are some reasons to really prefer aircraft as a system for supporting ground troops and destroying targets. For one thing, it's really, really hard to make a gun shoot as far as an aircraft can fly at the full extent of its combat radius. There are reasons that you want to have aircraft doing a lot of your fire support and destruction of enemy targets. The question is, is that enough to compensate for the relatively low number of artillery systems that you see in some Western militaries? So the question becomes, what sort of wars are you likely to fight? Are you going to fight wars where the massive preponderance of Western air power is going to be useful, deployable? Is it more useful than having more artillery systems? That's an open question. What's clear is there probably needs to be some consideration of what it would look like to fight a war in a contested air situation, where you couldn't just pulverise the enemy into dust using your ground attack air assets and your standoff precision munitions. And also, what is the impact of a growing number of long-range, ground-based precision strike options? And these sort of strikes have caused real problems for arms that normally wouldn't face this sort of problem. The Russian helicopter arm, the rotary aviation, has repeatedly suffered from the fact that these relatively short-range helicopters are based at air bases relatively close to the front lines, and then they get hit by Ukrainian very long-range artillery strikes, causing massive damage. At the same time, artillery and systems like GMLRS from the HIMARS cause real problems for traditional air defence situations. We saw this on Snake Island. While it might be economically efficient to use an advanced anti-aircraft missile system to shoot down an incoming jet or an incoming helicopter, or even to shoot down an incoming drone, it's not really economically efficient to shoot down $500 artillery shells, or even $1,500, $2,000, $10,000 artillery shells. When you're talking about something like a GMLRS rocket, it's easy to see why the procurement guys would look at this and go, this is a fantastic weapon. Uh, you're looking at a weapon system that when it was first being purchased cost about $40,000, it's considerably more now, but that's still much cheaper than a lot of the alternative options. When you think about how much it costs to put a jet in the air for an hour, or how much a cruise missile costs, it's very hard to cost-effectively defend against an incoming volley of six GMLRS rockets fired from a HIMARS system. Are you going to fire up six Book or S-300 missiles in response, or are you going to let at least one of them hit and watch your ammo dump go boom? On Snake Island, we saw this happen in real time only with conventional artillery rather than guided rockets. Snake Island, uh, after being taken by the Russians, they at great cost managed to get a number of air defence systems onto the island, books and panziers mostly. And then the Ukrainians got one long-range artillery gun in range, and using base bleed rounds, extended rain ammunitions, they used this self-propelled gun to basically just start shelling the island. There's no cover on Snake Island, and they destroyed these advanced air defence systems because they were helpless against incoming dumb ammunition. We're already seeing programs in NATO countries that sort of fit this bill. The precision strike missile has a much longer range than GMLRS and ATACMs before it, and will give systems like HIMARS and M270 the ability to reach out to targets 500 odd kilometres behind the lines. That means that there's a lot of targets which would normally have to be ser um, serviced by aircraft or cruise missiles that might now instead be attacked by cheaper, more affordable land based missile systems. And as for artillery, the West already has systems like Excalibur and a range of extended range and guided 155mm shells 
maybe there's going to be a focus on those sort of systems going forward to make sure that in counter battery scenarios or in operational scenarios where you want to shell targets behind the lines, you have that option available to you and you don't end up getting outranged by opponent who might have hardware that is maybe older, maybe a little less accurate, but has the reach advantage over you and leaves you in a difficult position. The next thing that I think is worth calling out is the huge premium that both sides have started placing on range. It's not just about how much metal you can throw, it's about how far you can throw it. And in an environment where you've got counter-battery fire with artillery trying to hunt artillery, the best countermeasure that both sides have been able to find is just being out of range of the other guy's guns. In an environment where it's really hard to hide, where you've got drones doing reconnaissance, where you've got satellite imagery, where you've got counter-battery radars, where you have informers with mobile phones on the ground, and it's really hard to hide your guns for any length of time, all of this technology has kind of forced armies to regress and put a focus on just being out of range of the other guy's artillery. And to the end, we've seen both the Ukrainians and the Russians roll out ostensibly older systems, but systems that have longer ranges over and above more modern systems with higher rates of fire, but perhaps not as much reach. It also stresses the importance of strikes into operational depths. What I mean by that, it's not just that the Ukrainians and the Russians are shelling the forward positions. They're not just shelling the trenches and the towns where the enemy is dug in. They're trying to reach out and touch ammunition depots, command points, air defense installations, things that are decently behind the lines, but which have great value if they're destroyed. And again, that puts a real premium on how much range your systems have. So what can I say in conclusion? I think the first thing to say is that artillery has been one of the definitive and decisive weapons at every stage of the war in Ukraine to date. Where Russia has been defeated, it's often been as a result of the work of the Ukrainian artillery crews. And where Ukraine has been pushed back, it's often been as a result of the work of the Russian artillery crews. In the early stage of the war, it was clear that the assault elements, the airborne forces, the light units that Russia sent forward to try and take critical targets, weren't universally successful. That they lacked the capability in some places to push through prepared Ukrainian defences with determined infantry and good shoulder-fired anti-tank guided missile weapon systems. And the result of that has been a a steady trend towards a more static form of warfare where artillery really gets to play to its strengths. Russia still very clearly has the overall advantage in the artillery war. It has far deeper stocks of ammunition, far greater stock of guns, and is continually outshooting Ukraine in the primary areas of contest. But that doesn't mean that Ukraine hasn't been able to fight back. And we've seen some very interesting asymmetric usage of artillery against things like targets behind the lines and encounter battery rolls that really are interesting and should serve as a point of interest and learning for foreign observers going forward. There are a lot of questions now over how both sides' artillery forces will evolve. Ukraine faces very strict limitations on its supply of ammo for the bulk of its old Soviet systems, and there is a very heavy reliance on the West for a continued resupply of both new NATO systems and the ammunition to fire them. There's a lot of new developments. Things like the introduction of the HIMARS system are very new as of the time of recording. It'll be interesting to see what impact they have once both the Russians adapt and once the Ukrainians gain access to more of those systems. So a lot of the questions about what happens next hinge on matters of supply, Ukrainian resupply with additional Western systems, and Russia's ability to supply additional spotting drones, additional precision-guided munitions, and to re-barrel guns that have been burned out during the massive bombardments that have been necessary to push the front forward in the Donbass. Whatever happens next in the war, there are already points that seem to suggest there are areas for potential lessons for foreign observing countries, be they NATO or otherwise, around the use of drone spotting, precision fires, and the interaction with a contested airspace battlefield, but I feel I've covered those sufficiently and won't recap them here. One thing I will note is we are dealing with massively imperfect information as always. One example of this might be, for example, I talk a lot about videos of precision shooting being done throughout the course of this video. Well, just think for a moment, do you really think people are likely to publish videos of their misses? We won't really get a good idea of what regular accuracy is until the war is over and we have access to better data. Speaking of people not publishing misses, however, uh, I do have a screenshot from that Russian video I mentioned earlier where they claim they destroy a bunch of HIMARS systems. You can judge for yourself. Uh, You can search that video up if you need to. But having looked at it as closely as I possibly can, it honestly looks like they're aiming at some bushes and maybe some trucks and then when the strike comes in i know you can't see it from the photo they miss so there you go okay channel update to close out 
First thing to apologize for is the fact that I am currently traveling. So if you've heard the sound quality jump around over the course of this episode, it's because I'm recording from multiple different locations. I'm sorry about that. I'm doing the best with the kit I'm traveling with, but you may hear different levels of echoes from slide to slide, depending on where I recorded something. The second thing to say is that I was really excited to do this one. It feels good to do another video in this series. This is in the same series as our video on lessons of usage for drones, ATGMs, end of the tank, etc. And it was good to finally look at artillery systems, which is an area where we've got an asymmetric conflict between Russia, which is a very, very strong artillery power, and Ukraine, which is trying to fight sort of an asymmetric artillery duel while also being resupplied by the West. Looking into my previous videos, um, I want to thank all the kind Germans who reached out after I attacked procurement in the Bundeswehr. That video was very technical, a little dry, very long, and also uh, not particularly positive in the outlook it took towards the Bundeswehr's purchasing function. I have to say, so many Germans reached out to say they appreciated the video. I also heard from some people who have served in official roles there, and they were very positive as well. Um, they debated a few points in a few cases, but generally very positive, and I genuinely appreciate that. I am working on a couple more videos in parallel at the same time. I've currently got a collaboration video I'm working on, which is aimed at illustrating concepts of how you can make procurements go wrong, i.e. why governments buy stupid stuff. And the way I'm doing that is we're going to do a video where we choose the worst possible aircraft of World War II, or rather an Australian colleague on YouTube chooses what he thinks the worst aircraft of World War II are, and then I have to try and convince government or give reasons that I can convince government to purchase the things. So that one we're working on at the moment should be very exciting, and I hope to do more collabs in the future. I also want to just give a thanks to everyone for their support as always. Engagement in my comment sections is a genuine point of pride for me. It's always so polite, well-reasoned, well-debated, and incredibly active. I very much appreciate it. And of course, thank you to the sponsor, including today's sponsor, Private Internet Access, for helping to make these uh, longer, more in-depth productions that do take quite a lot of time to put together, keeping these things viable for me to keep doing. So thank you to all. Take care, and I'll see you all again soon.